welcome back guys now in this video let's discuss about the liver pathology okay seeing you after a long time so now in this class we'll be discussing about uh, cholelithiasis cholecystitis primary biliary sclerosis primary sclerosing cholangitis if possible we'll also be doing some other miscellaneous topics okay having said that before going to the topic i want you to know certain things about the bile so where bile is getting produced generally where bile is going to be produced a bile it is produced the liver okay bile is produced in the liver every day 500 ml so what is the function of the bile sir the function of the bile is emulsification emulsification okay the function of the bile is emulsification so what exactly is this emulsification sir emulsification is the process of converting Okay, emulsification means it's a process of converting large lipid droplet. See, now you are eating okay, fats. So, whenever you eat fats, those fats are going to be complex molecules. They're going to be a big molecules, complex molecules. So, large lipid droplets. See, on this large lipid droplets, the lipases cannot act and they cannot digest. So, now you need to convert these large lipid droplets into smaller droplets. Smaller droplets. So, what is the process of emulsification, sir? The bile is going to do the emulsification. So, what exactly is this emulsification? Conversion of large lipid droplets into smaller droplets. This process is called as emulsification. So, who is doing this emulsification process for us? The bile acids and bile salts. So, the bile acids and bile salts which are present in the bile. Okay, in the bile, bile acids and bile salts are there. So, these bile acids and bile salts helps in the conversion of a large lipid droplet to the smaller droplets. So, this process is called as emulsification and after emulsification, there will be digestion of the fats with the help of lipases. Lipases are going to digest the fats, okay, lipids. Now, my question to you is, sir, what exactly is present in the bile? Okay, bile is helping in the process of emulsification. Bile is helping in the digestion of the fats, okay. But what exactly is there in the bile, sir? You already know it. Bile acids are there. Bile salts are there. Next, bile pigments. So, bile pigments. So, what are the bile pigments? You know it. It's a bilirubin. Okay, it's a conjugated bilirubin is there. Bile acids, bile salts, bile pigments. Next, cholesterol. Cholesterol. Next, phospholipids. and water and electrolytes okay water and electrolytes so first let's start with the basics sir. first let's understand in the basic understanding okay let's have the basic understanding later we'll discuss about the cholelithiasis cholecystitis okay what happens you can understand later so first what you should know is the basics okay see what exactly these bile acids and bile salts made up of so, the bile acids and bile salts, they are made up of cholesterol. See, it's a cholesterol. Okay. It's a cholesterol. With the help of this enzyme, there is an enzyme which is called as cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase. So with the help of this enzyme, okay, there is this one enzyme which is called as cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase. With the help of this enzyme, the cholesterol will be converted into bile acids and bile salts so the first point which i want you to know is sir bile acids and bile salts they are nothing but okay this bile acids and bile salts they are nothing but cholesterol okay it's nothing but the cholesterol sir okay it's nothing but the cholesterol so what is the function of these bile acids and bile salts once you have these bile acids and bile salts these bile acids and bile salts they will help in dissolving the cholesterol into the bile see there is also cholesterol okay there is cholesterol in the bile sir now, this cholesterol need to be in a solubilized form. It need to be in a dissolved form. So, who helps in this process? It's the bile acids and bile salts. They helps in dissolving. They helps in dissolving cholesterol into bile. Okay, they helps in dissolving the cholesterol into bile. Okay, so it keeps the cholesterol in a dissolved form. So, keep this point in mind. So, it's a cholesterol which is getting converted into bile acids and bile salts. Okay, it's a cholesterol which is getting converted into bile acids and bile salts. And this bile acid and bile salts, 
बाइल एसिड बाइल सॉल्कोल इज़ द वन विच हेल्प्स इन द डिसॉल्विंग द कोलेस्ट्रॉल इट द बाइल ठीक है नाउ लेट्स से सम इम्पोर्टेंट कॉजेस के सम इम्पोर्टेंट कॉजेस फॉर द गॉल्स्टोन सर सो द टॉपिक लेट्स बिगिन इट्स अ कोलिलिथियासिस सो व्हाट एक्जेक्टली इज कोलिलिथियासिस ओके कोलिलिथियासिस मींस गॉल्स्टोन्स स्टोन्स इन गॉल ब्लैडर के गॉल ब्लैडर stones so why one can have this gallbladder stone why is the reason number one the most important reason is hypercholesterolemia hypercholesterolemia so high amount of cholesterol in the body if the patient is having high amount of cholesterol the high amount of cholesterol can also be present in the bile so this cholesterol will precipitate and forms the cholesterol gallstones hypercholesterolemia Especially, which sex is going to be affected? Females, females, especially in their forties, okay, are going to be affected. That's one of the reason. Okay, females are going to. Uh, so that's one of the cause for the cholelithiasis. Females are at high risk of developing the cholesterol gallstones, and pregnancy. Pregnancy is the risk for the cholelithiasis. Why pregnancy is a risk factor? Why? Because during pregnancy there is a hormone present which is called as progesterone. So this progesterone. What kind of hormone is progesterone? Progesterone is a smooth muscle, relaxant. It's a smooth muscle relaxant. As it's a smooth muscle relaxant, it causes relaxation of the gallbladder. Okay, smooth muscle uh, relaxant. So gallbladder relaxation, no proper contraction. Gall bladder relaxation. So do you think gallbladder contraction is happening? Do you think gallbladder contraction is happening? No, gallbladder is not contracting properly. Now, as the gallbladder is not contracting properly, there is no bile let out. The bile is not coming into the duodenum. The bile is just present in the gallbladder. As the bile just present over there, there is biliary stasis. Now there is biliary stasis. The bile is not coming into the duodenum. So from the bile, do you know what happens? From the bile, water is going to be reabsorbed. Okay, as the bile is staying in one place for a lot of time, the water is being reabsorbed from the bile. So the bile becomes thicker, thicker, thicker. The bile is getting thicker. as the bile is getting thicker it forms a biliary sludge okay now it's a thick bile it's a lithogenic bile i can say okay it's a lithogenic bile or the biliary sludge thick now in such cases the cholesterol is going to precipitate and forms the stones okay so pregnancy progesterone is there it's a smooth muscle relaxant it causes gallbladder relaxation that causes biliary stasis biliary stasis sir now that biliary stasis can cause cholesterol gallstones in most of the cases the gallstones will be cholesterol gallstones only okay what are the other gallstones there are pigmented gallstones that i will discuss in a few minutes so what are the risk factors hypercholesterolemia female females and pregnancy okay what else what else the drugs like fibrates so the drugs like fibrates are risk factor why fibrates are a risk factor see this fibrates as a side effect okay as a side effect see fibrates are used to treat the hypercholesterolemia so okay that's okay but fibrates they inhibit an enzyme okay this fibrates they inhibit an enzyme called as cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase the cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase enzyme is being inhibited by the fibrates okay when this enzyme is inhibited what happens sir i have explained you sir it's a rate limiting enzyme so the cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase is very much important for the production of bile acids and bile salts now this fibrates are the drugs okay phenofibrate gemfibrozil these are the anti hyperlipidemic drugs right now when you inhibit this cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase the bile acid and bile salt pool decreases okay are you getting the bile acid bile salt pool decreases when the bile acid bile salt pool decreases now what happens do you think cholesterol will be kept in solubilized form i have said you the bile acids and bile salts are very much important to keep the cholesterol in soluble form in the bile so when the bile acids and bile salts are not there means okay what happens the cholesterol will start to precipitate and it forms stones so bile acid bile salt pool decreases that increases the cholesterol precipitation that increases the cholesterol precipitation forms the gall stones it causes the gallstones so fibrates are a risk factor okay females risk uh, the female sex is a risk factor fibrates are a risk factor pregnancy is a risk factor okay next 
those who are on the total parental nutrition, okay, those persons who are on the total parental nutrition, TPN, on long-term TPN, the patient is on long-term TPN, which means he is not eating anything via the mouth. He is not eating anything via the mouth. Okay, no carbohydrates, no proteins, no fats via the mouth, sir. Okay, nothing is through the mouth. So, tell me, as the patient is not eating anything via the mouth, is he taking fats? No. So, what I want you to know is, in total parental nutrition, nothing via mouth. If nothing is going via the mouth into the duodenum, nothing is going into the stomach into the duodenum. So, the eye cells, the duodenal eye cells are not stimulated. Usually, fats stimulates the duodenal eye cells. Now, he is not taking any fats, okay, via the mouth. So, the duodenal eye cells, they are not stimulated. If they are not stimulated, what happened to the CCK? Cholecystokinin. So, the, do you think cholecystokinin is produced? The cholecystokinin is not produced because he is not eating anything via the mouth. The G, uh, eye cells are not stimulated. They say, these neuroendocrine cells, these eye cells are the neuroendocrine cells in the duodenum, they are not getting stimulated. As they are not getting stimulated, they are not producing the cholecystokinin. If the cholecystokinin is not there, it's not there. So, do you think gallbladder will contract? Cholecystokinin is the cholegog, sir. It's a cholegog. It causes the gallbladder contractions. Now, cholecystokinin is not there. As it's not there, gallbladder contractions are not going to be there. So, no gallbladder contractions. If the gallbladder is not contracting, that causes biliary stasis. Okay, it causes biliary stasis. Okay, so that biliary stasis is going to cause the gallstones. Okay, biliary stasis will occur. Now, bile is just staying in the gallbladder. So, from the bile, water is going to be reabsorbed. So, bile will become thick, lithogenic bile. So, gallstones can occur. So, the person who is on the total parental nutrition, he is at risk of developing gallstones True, no doubt. He is at risk of developing the gallstones. No doubt in that. And those who are using the fibrates can develop the gallstones. Pregnancy can cause the gallstones. And what else? So, ileal resection, the fourth condition which is very important for the exams. So, ileal resection. Ileal resection. So, the patient had a surgery. Now, his ileum is removed, sir. The ileum, ileum is removed. So, what happens? Sir, ileum is a place where, ileum is a place where normally bile acids and bile salts are reabsorbed back into the body. Once the bile is released, bile acids, bile salts, they will do emulsification. Emulsification completed, fat digestion completed. Now, again, from the ileum region, the bile acids and bile salts are again reuptaken back into the liver. They are again reuptaken back into the liver. From where? From the ileum. Now, if you remove the ileum because of some cancer or some other reason, because of some, like, you know, ulcerative disease. Now, if ileum is removed, what happens? So, decrease reabsorption of, decrease reabsorption of bile acids and bile salts. So, the bile acids and bile salts are going to go down. Okay, bile acids and bile salts are going to go down. So, now, the bile acid bile salt pool decreases, the reabsorption decreases, bile acid bile salts pool is getting decreased. Whenever the bile acid bile salt pool decreases, what happened to the cholesterol, sir? I have explained you already. The cholesterol is going to precipitate. Okay, the cholesterol is going to precipitate. Going to precipitate. Going to precipitate. Cholesterol is going to precipitate and forms the gallstones. Okay, cholesterol is going to precipitate and form the gallstones. So, Ileal resection is a risk factor, total parental nutrition is a risk factor, using of drugs like fibrates and pregnancy is a risk factor, females are a risk factor, the sex, female sex is a risk factor, hypercholesterolemia, okay, and sudden decrease in the weight, sudden decrease in weight, obesity, okay, so all these are risk factors, okay, all these are the risk factors for gallstones. Now, the second type of gallstones, usually whatever I have discussed so far, they are all the cholesterol gallstones, okay, they are all the cholesterol gallstones. The second type of gallstones which I want you to know for your exam is called as a pigmented gallstones, okay. The second type of gallstones are pigmented gallstones. So, what are these pigmented gallstones seen in which conditions? See, these pigmented gallstones, usually they are in black color, they are highly seen in two conditions, sir. That is, they are seen in two conditions. One is hereditary spherocytosis. They are seen in hereditary spherocytosis, one condition, and sickle cell anemia. 
testicle cell anemias. Now, why? If you ask me, sir, why? In both the conditions, what is happening, sir? In both the conditions, what is happening? There is hemolysis. In both the conditions, there is hemolysis that is happening. So, if the hemolysis is happening, what happens? The RBCs are getting broken down. So, RBCs are getting broken down. Hemoglobin is released. Hemoglobin will be broken down further into heme and globin. Globin is used by the body back. Globin is going to be, it's a protein. Globin is a protein which is degraded and amino acids are going to be produced. Those amino acids are going to be reabsorbed back by the body. But what about this heme? Heme is broken down into protoporphyrin and iron. The protoporphyrin is converted into bilirubin. Already we have discussed all these things. So what I am trying to put into your mind is, sir, in hereditary spirocytosis condition, okay, in this one condition called as a hereditary spirocytosis and sickle cell anemia, there is excessive hemolysis that is happening. Sir, as there is excessive hemolysis, there is increased production of bilirubin. Okay, excessive bilirubin is getting produced. Sir, this bilirubin is going to come into the bile. The bilirubin is going to come into the bile. Now, in the bile, this bilirubin reacts with calcium and forms calcium bilirubinate. Calcium bilirubinate. Calcium bilirubinate. So, the calcium is getting binding to this bilirubin. So, now forming a stone. So, these stones are going to be pigmented gallstones. So, pigmented gallstones are made up of what? Calcium bilirubinate. Okay. So, in your exam, they will ask you, the pigmented gallstones are seen in which condition? Most of the time, it will be the hereditary spirocytosis or sickle cell anemia and these pigmented gallstones are made up of calcium bilirubinate. Okay. So, what else I want you to know for your exams? Okay. What else I want you to know for your exams? Sir? See, uh, like, if you want to know why females, okay, why females are at risk of getting, like, you know, these cholesterol gallstones, why they most commonly get this cholesterol gallstones is because, so, in the females, what is the hormone that is present? The estrogens. Okay. So, estrogens, what they upregulate? Sir, estrogen upregulates, okay, an enzyme which is called as HMG CoA reductase. Okay, HMG CoA reductase. See, this HMG CoA reductase is getting activated. So, what it does? It, do, it helps in the cholesterol synthesis. Okay. Cholesterol synthesis. So, usually in a females, high levels of estrogens will be there. Those high levels of estrogens, if any female who is having higher levels of estrogen, hyperestrogenic states, so this estrogen activates this enzyme called as HMG CoA reductase that favors the cholesterol synthesis. So, more cholesterol is there means there is a more chance that this cholesterol can precipitate and forms the gallstones. Okay, it can forms the gallstones. Now, what happens if there are gallstones? Okay, gallstones, hey, so what happens? What happens? Look, guys, here, if the gallstones are there, means, look, now, uh, just look at the biliary tree. See, here, see, this is cholesterol, but if there is gallstone, what those gallstones will do? Sometimes, occasionally, occasionally, when the gallbladder is contracting, when the gallbladder is contracting, there is a chance, there is a chance that these gallstones will come and block the cystic duct. Okay, what is this duct, sir? That's a cystic duct, which is taking the bile into the duodenum. Okay, that cystic duct got blocked. So, now there is going to be an obstruction in the biliary pathway. Okay, there is obstruction in the biliary pathway. So, what happens? The bile is not going to go into the stomach, or I should say the bile is not going to enter into the GATC. It's not coming into the duodenum. The bile is not going to enter into the duodenum. So, where all this bile is going to do? Sir, the bile is getting blocked here. Okay, the bile is getting blocked over there. Okay. Because the cystic duct is the cystic duct is blocked, it will cause obstructive jaundice. It can cause obstructive jaundice. The patient can have obstructive jaundice. Sir. That is the one important point which I want you to know. So the patient who is having, okay, the patient who is having uh, this gallstones, right? Gallstones occasionally blocks the cystic duct. Okay, they, they block and again they will come back, sir. They blocks and again they usually come back. Okay, the, the block is going to usually relieve. Okay, so the gallstones, they occasionally block the cystic duct. When they are blocking the cystic duct, what happens? Now the bile cannot go out. Now the bile is not going out. Okay, so now the classical question that will come in your exam is, the classical question that will come in your exam is, see the, this patient who is taking the fats. Now there is this one guy who is taking fats. Now whenever he is taking fats, Fats stimulates which cells? Fats stimulates eye cells. 
Okay, fats are going to stimulate the eye cells. So the eye cells are going to produce which hormone? The eye cells are going to produce cholecystokinin. Eye cells are producing the cholecystokinin. Sir, this cholecystokinin, what it will do? It causes the gallbladder contractions. It causes the gallbladder contractions. But what is the problem with the gallbladder? Sir, gallbladder is okay, but the duct is blocked. Now, gallbladder is trying to contract and send the bile and send the bile into the cystic duct, but the cystic duct is blocked. So, now, do you think the bile is going to come out? No. So, the gallbladder is trying to contract with a, with a blocked duct. With a blocked duct, the gallbladder is contracting. So, that causes the pain. So, upon taking the fats, the patient is going to have pain. Why pain? Because this cholecystokinin is causing gallbladder contractions. If gallbladder is contracting, that's not a problem. But the gallbladder is contracting with a blocked duct. The duct is blocked with a stone and the gallbladder is contracting. So, bile is not going to go out. So, that causes the pain, sir. So, in one of the exam, the question was asked, which hormone is responsible for the pain during for the pain during this cholecyst uh, the cholelithiasis. Okay. So, the hormone responsible is cholecystokinin. So, it's the cholecystokinin which is causing the pain. And the pain, where the pain, the patient, uh, where the pain is going to be? The pain is going to be in the right upper quadrant. The patient is going to have pain in the right upper quadrant, sir. Okay. So, that's the point which I want you to know. Okay. Next. What else? are the important points that you should know for your exams. I have explained you pigmented gallstones, okay, pigmented gallstones and uh, normal cholesterol gallstones. Here, let me add one more point which was asked in the exam. See, hereditary spherocytosis. So, can you tell me what is hereditary spherocytosis? The hereditary spherocytosis condition may, the RBCs are getting destroyed in the spleen. Okay, the RBCs are getting destroyed in the spleen. So, the problem is in the spleen, sir. Unnecessarily, the RBCs, are getting destroyed in the spleen. Okay, so in one of the exam, the question asked, what is the treatment for the hereditary spherocytosis? What is the management? What we have to do? The splenectomy. That is a very high yielding thing. So splenectomy is done. Okay, splenectomy is done. Okay, so we remove the spleen usually. Okay, in some of the exams, they can also say that splenectomy along with cholecystectomy. So, splenectomy along with the cholecystectomy. So, spleen is removed. Why cholecystectomy? Why we are removing the gallbladder cholecystectomy? Why? Because the stones are getting formed. Okay. So, the stones are getting formed in the gallbladder. So, we do, we do both splenectomy and cholecystectomy. Okay. The removal the, remove of the gallbladder. Okay. So, these are the some points which I want you to know for your exam, sir. Okay. So, splenectomy is the treatment done for the hereditary spherocytosis. Next. The next topic which I want to discuss here is cholecystitis. The cholelithiasis is completed. Now let's discuss about cholecystitis, sir. Cholecystitis. So how to identify that the patient is having cholecystitis? So exactly the cushion framework is going to be like exactly they will say that the pain is in the right upper quadrant upon taking the fat. Okay, there is obstruction and that obstructive jaundice symptoms can be seen. See, if they mention everything like polylithiasis, let me put it this way. They will mention all the symptoms, all the symptoms, it looks like the patient is having polylithiasis, sir. So, polylithiasis. Now, along with this polylithiasis, the patient will say, now he is having fever. Okay. So, the patient is going to say, uh, the, the cushion is going to say, the patient is also having fever. So, what exactly is the problem, sir? What exactly happened? See, now the stones got permanently blocked here. Okay, now the stone is totally blocked here. It is not coming back. It is not falling back into the gallbladder. It is totally blocked. It is totally blocked. And when it is totally blocked, what happens? Now, infection will start to happen in the gallbladder. So, now infection and inflammation. Okay. Now, inflammation is there and infection is going to be there in the gallbladder. Okay, so it just looks like it exactly sounds like the patient is having cholelithiasis upon which the patient have developed the inflammation, inf infection and inflammation in the gallbladder. Okay, so if you perform in the question, what they will mention is, sir, this patient upon doing ultrasonography, there is thickening, thickening 
of gallbladder wall. Okay, the gallbladder wall is thickened. So this is the keyword. Upon doing the ultrasonography, what you have found out? You have found out that gallbladder wall is thickened because of the inflammation. So there is thickening of the gallbladder wall. Okay, so usually we do the uh, ultrasonography uh, for like you know looking at the gallbladder. If the ultrasonography is coming negative. If the ultrasonography is negative, which means you cannot see any gallstones. The thickening of the gallbladder is not seen. The one more scan which can be done is HIDA scan. If this is negative, you can also go with other scan called as a HIDA scan. Okay, to look at the gallbladder. Okay, so what I'm trying to put into your mind, sir, in this cholecystitis, okay, cholecystitis, there is gallstone. So most of the time, the cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder, most of the time it comes in the background of cholelithiasis that the stone got blocked. Now, there is infection and inflammation happening in the gallbladder. There is thickening of the gallbladder wall, inflammation in the gallbladder wall. Now, the point which I want you to know is, if the person is having cholecystitis, so there is no need that the alkaline phosphatase levels and the alkaline phosphatase levels and what else? The alkaline phosphatase levels as well as the, um, the ALT levels, AST levels, they are not usually elevated, sir. They are not elevated because it's not a problem with the liver. Okay, it's not a problem with the liver, sir. So usually these hormones, sorry, these enzymes, the alkaline phosphatase, ALP, uh, ALT, AST, okay, alanine, aminotransferase, okay, aspartate, um, aminotransferases, they are not usually elevated. Okay, because it is cholecystitis inflammation of the gallbladder. Gallbladder. In one of the exam, the question was asked something like this. So the patient is a known case of cholelithiasis. He is having a cholelithiasis. Okay, in the ultrasonography, it's very clear that stones are there, gallstones are there. Now he presented to the clinic with right upper quadrant pain. Okay, he's having right upper quadrant pain. Upon doing the ultrasonography, the bladder wall is thickened, and in the bladder wall, there is this air bubbles present. So air present in gallbladder wall. So what might be the reason the air present in the gallbladder wall, sir? What might be the reason? See, now the gallbladder is infected. Okay, in cholecystitis, the gallbladder is infected. Infected with what? Infected with an organism which is producing the gas. So there is this one organism which is producing the gas and this gas is going into the gallbladder. So what is that organism usually produces? The gas gangrene produces the gas, sir. So that's the organism is going to be Clostridium perfringens. Okay, Clostridium perfringens. So this Clostridium perfringens, this organism is going to produce the gas, sir. It causes usually gas gangrene. So that's why our gallbladder is infected with this organism, Clostridium perfringens. So it can cause emphysematous cholecystitis. So that's the air. So emphysematous. Cholecystitis. Okay, emphysematous cholecystitis, sir. Okay. Now, so this is about the acute episode. Acute cholecystitis. Sudden right upper quadrant pain is going to be there. With fever. Okay, with fever is going to be there. Upon doing the ultrasonography, the gallbladder wall is going to be thickened. Okay. So in certain conditions, like infection with the clostridium perfringens, you can see emphysematous cholecystitis. These things are going to be there, sir. Okay. Okay, what is the treatment done? Sir, the treatment done for these conditions is cholecystectomy. You have to completely remove the gallbladder. Okay, cholecystectomy. Okay, because there's a block, you cannot just remove it. So cholecystectomy. Cholecystectomy. Now, what about the chronic cholecystitis? What is chronic cholecystitis, sir? Chronic cholecystitis means imagine. So there is gallbladder and cystic duct, stone going into the cystic duct, causing inflammation in the gallbladder, again it's coming back. Stone going into the cystic duct, causing inflammation, and again it's coming back. So multiple repeated, okay, repeated acute cholecystitis are happening, acute cholecystitis, multiple cholecystitis are happening, okay. So repeated acute cholecystitis. 
means inflammation of the gallbladder resolving again inflammation of the gallbladder again resolving again inflammation of the gallbladder again resolving so multiple bouts okay, multiple episodes can lead to chronic cholecystitis okay so acute cholecystitis can cause chol chronic cholecystitis so what exactly is happening in the chronic cholecystitis sir so in the chronic cholecystitis the important point which i want you to know it's not it's not just thickening of the gallbladder so it's not just thickening of the gallbladder the gallbladder is getting calcified calcification of gallbladder it is a calcification of the gallbladder so this calcified gallbladder now it is called as porcelain gallbladder okay what it is called as porcelain gallbladder the important point about this porcelain gallbladder is so whoever have this porcelain gallbladder there is a chance that they will turn into cancer okay they will get the cancer sir so this porcelain gallbladder it increases the risk of cancer, sir. Cancer in the gallbladder. So, this is the one important point which I want you to know. Okay. So, the most important point which I want you to know is the repeated attacks. Repeated attacks of acute cholecystitis can lead to chronic cholecystitis where there is calcification of gallbladder. Okay, where there is calcification of gallbladder, sir. Okay. Next, so there is chronic cholecystitis or porcelain gallbladder. Again, the treatment is going to be cholecystectomy. Cholecystectomy. Done. Okay. Next, what I want you to know is the next topic which I want you to know is prim uh, primary. See, before going to the primary thing, I want to you to know one more important thing sir that is cholecolithiasis cholle lithiasis lithiasis what is cholecolithiasis what exactly is this a small topic but which is, uh, but important most of the student what doesn't know what exactly is cholecolithiasis the cholelithiasis is stones in the gallbladder okay stones were in the gallbladder sir now if the stones were coming from the gallbladder and now once they enter okay once they enter into the biliary tree now they are coming into the common bile ducts now the stones are coming into the bile ducts so what is cholecolithiasis cholecolithiasis means stone can be there anywhere in the biliary tree the stone which can be there anywhere in the biliary tree okay right stones in biliary tree Anywhere, not in the gallbladder. Don't confuse it with the cholelithiasis. Stones in biliary tree. So, what they are causing, sir? They are causing obstruction. Okay. Now, it's not in the, now it's not just in the cystic duct, sir. Anywhere. So, cholelithiasis, stones anywhere in the biliary tree. So, what it will cause? It will cause obstructive jaundice. Obstructive jaundice. Okay. Because the biliary pathway is obstructed. Now, in all the cases of this obstructive jaundice, whenever there is obstructive jaundice, what happens, sir? The bile is not going out. The bile is not coming into the duodenum. So, in all the cases of obstructive jaundice, the one point which I want you to know is the ALP levels, alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated. It's a common thing, sir. Because of this gallstone, because of this gallstone, which is blocking the biliary tree, the biliary tree is now getting blocked. As the biliary tree is getting blocked, so alkaline phosphatase levels are going to be elevated. Not only this, which bilirubins are going to be elevated? The liver is okay. There is no problem with the liver. Okay. But the bile is not coming into the duodenum. So, direct bilirubin levels are going to be elevated. The conjugated bilirubin levels are going to be elevated. Why? Because the conjugated bilirubin is not going into the duodenum. Why? Because there is a block. There is a block. So, these patients are going to have increased levels of direct bilirubin levels. So, direct bilirubin levels are going to be elevated. Okay. So, usually, how they will ask you the question? Sir, cholecolithiasis, stones in the biliary tree. How they will ask you the question is, you will simply say, the person recently had abdominal pain, right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Now, what we have done is, ultrasonography, we have done the ultrasonography. When you have performed the ultrasonography, it's very clear that there are stones in the gallbladder. 
Okay, there are stones in the gallbladder. So now what you have performed is you have performed the surgery. You have done the surgery. You have removed the gallbladder. Cholecystectomy done. Okay, cholecystectomy done. You have removed the gallbladder. But still, even after removing the gallbladder, still he is having pain. Still he is having pain. Even after removing the gallbladder, what happened is the some stones are still left over. The some stones are still left over in the biliary tree. Okay. Some stones are still left over in the biliary tree. The biliary tree is not properly examined after the surgery. Say, after the surgery, what you have to do? You have to examine the biliary tree. The cholangiography should be performed. Okay, to see the patency of the biliary tree, you have to perform the cholangiography. Whether is there is any leftover stone, is there is any residual stone in the biliary tree. You have to perform cholangiography. So, the cholangiography is not performed. So, as the cholangiography is not performed, still some stone is left over in the gallbladder, uh, still some stone is left over in the biliary tree. So, bile is not properly draining. Okay, the bile is not properly drained from the liver. Okay, the bile, the bile is not properly getting drained from the liver, sir. Okay, so usually question will come something like this. Okay, a patient with right upper quadrant pain done. What we have done? We have done abdo uh, like abdominal ultrasonography. Okay, ultrasonography, where it, it's very clear that the patient is having gallstones. So, what we have performed? We have performed cholecystectomy. Okay, cholecystectomy. After cholecystectomy, we haven't done no, no cholangiography. Okay, no cholangiography, sir. Okay, there is no cholangiography. So, we haven't done the cholangiography, so there is chance that he is still having stone. So where is the stone present? Stone in biliary tree. Or maybe in the common bile duct. Okay, maybe in the common bile duct. So stone in biliary tree. So that's what is causing the obstruction. So still the alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated. The, the direct bilirubin levels are elevated. Okay, so first we have to do the ultrasonography. Okay, to look for the stone. Where is the stone, sir? Okay, this is the one important point which I want you to know regarding cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis. Okay. See, this cholelithiasis. Let me uh, tell me. Uh, let me tell you one more important point. So, how to differentiate between cholelithiasis and the Pancreatic cancer, very important for your exam. Differentiate between cholelithiasis versus pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic head cancer. Look, guys, if there is a cholelithiasis, look, let me show you. So, here is a block, for example, say, here is a block, sir. Cholelithiasis. So, there is obstruction in the flow of the bile. There is obstruction in the flow of the bile. The bile is not coming out. Okay. Now, if there is a pancreatic cancer, cancer to the head of the pancreas. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. If there is a cancer, say, to the head of the pancreas, that pancreatic cancer can also cause obstruction. Okay. The pancreatic cancer can also cause obstruction to the bile pathway, to the flow of bile. How to differentiate between these two conditions? Whether the patient right now is having obstructive jaundice, sir. The patient is right now having the obstructive jaundice. Okay, the obstruction is there in the flow of the bile. Whether this obstruction is because of cholelithiasis or whether the obstruction is because of the cancer to the head of the pancreas. How to differentiate? Okay. Is, say, if it is pancreatic cancer, Okay, if it's pancreatic cancer, usually the patient is going to have weight loss. If they mention the symptoms, okay, if they mention the symptoms, the patient is going to have the weight loss. Okay, weight loss. Let me write here. See here in pancreatic head cancer, the patient is going to have weight loss. And whenever you do the CT, okay, CT, in the CT, it's very clear, okay, in the CT, it's going to be very clear that there is cancer in the pancreas. So, how to differentiate? There are two causes, sir. There are two causes 
of the obstructive jaundice. One is cholidocolithiasis, stones in the biliary tree. And second thing is pancreatic head cancer. If it is a pancreatic head cancer, that, pa that cancer can also compress the bile pathway and that can lead to the obstructive jaundice. So, in both the conditions, the patients are going to have elevated alkaline phosphatase levels, alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated. Not only that, the direct bilirubin, the direct bilirubin levels will be elevated. So, in both the conditions, they are elevated, sir. But you have to differentiate between whether it is a pancreatic carcinoma, whether it is a pancreatic carcinoma. So, even a question if they are mentioning that the patient is a smoker, heavy smoker, okay, heavy smoker, sir. Okay, the patient is a heavy smoker with weight loss. Now, you should think about heavy smoker, weight loss, and the CT, like you are seeing the cancer and the alkaline phosphatase levels, direct bilirubin levels are elevated. It's all pointing towards the pancreatic head cancer. Next. So, what is gallstone pancreatitis? Okay, we are discussing about the gallstones, right? And gallstone pancreatitis. So, what exactly is this gallstone pancreatitis? Okay, gallstone pancreatitis, what exactly it is? See, now, the gallstone, it is not there, it's not just there in the common bile duct. Okay, it's there in this region, sir. Let me put you, yes, here, in this region. So, what exactly is this region? So, this region is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla. Okay, hepatopancreatic, see, from the liver, and from the pancreas. So, this junction is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla. Actually, this is also a type of cholidocolithiasis. Okay, it's also a type of cholidocolithiasis, there is no doubt. But right now, the stone, the gallstone, where it is present, sir, the gallstone is present in the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Now, tell me, what the patient is going to have, sir? First of all, obstruction is there, obstructive jaundice, one thing. Obstructive jaundice will occur. The patient is going to have elevated alkaline phosphatase levels are going to be seen. Next, direct bilirubin levels are going to be elevated. Okay, but see the pancreatic secretions are also not going to be drained. The pancreas is also not properly secreting into the duodenum. Okay, so that's going to cause pancreatitis. Okay, that's what going to cause pancreatitis, sir. So if there is pancreatitis, what happens? The patient is going to have elevated levels of amylase, pancreatic amylase, pancreatic lipase. These enzymes are going to be elevated. So let me put like this. Let me put it this way. So, look, in gallstone pancreatitis, gallstone, where it is present in hepatopancreatic, okay, hepatopancreatic ampulla, okay, hepatopancreatic ampulla, mein, there is stone, sir. Now, that hepatopancreatic stone, the ampullary stone, what it is doing? On one side, it is going to cause obstructive jaundice. Okay, it's going to cause obstructive jaundice. So, whenever there is obstructive jaundice, the alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated as well as, like okay, alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated as well as direct bilirubin levels are elevated. Okay, direct bilirubin levels are elevated. Next, it's also going to block the pancreatic ducts. It's also going to block the pancreatic duct, I have shown you. So, that's what's going to cause the acute pancreatitis. So, whenever there is acute pancreatitis, the patient is going to have elevated levels of pancreatic amylase and lipases. So, pancreatic amylases and lipases are going to be elevated. So, these are the some important points, just not the pathology. I am just trying to integrate as much as possible so that it will be better for you from medicine also. Okay. So, as the hepatopancreatic ampulla is affected, the patient is going to have elevated levels of alkaline phosphatase, direct bilirubin as well as See, the pancreatic enzymes are also getting elevated. So, whenever you see both the pancreatic enzymes getting elevated as well as the symptoms of obstructive jaundice, you should think that, sir, now this is gallstone pancreatitis. Okay. Yeah. So, gallstone pancreatitis also completed, sir. After this, what else I should teach you? Now, let's discuss about primary biliary sclerosis. So, primary biliary sclerosis. So, what exactly is this primary biliary sclerosis? Primary biliary sclerosis. Uh, sorry, primary biliary cirrhosis. So, what exactly is this primary biliary sclerosis uh, or cir uh, cirrhosis? 
See, primary biliary cirrhosis is a condition, or I should say, it's an autoimmune condition. The autoimmune condition, sir. What is happening? So here, the intrahepatic bile ducts. See, in the in the liver also, bile ducts will be there, right? You look here. So these are the intrahepatic bile ducts. So these intrahepatic bile ducts are getting damaged. Okay. So there is damage to intrahepatic bile ducts. So in primary biliary cirrhosis, the autoimmune condition where intrahepatic bile ducts are damaged. Now when the intrahepatic bile ducts are damaged, again it's just looking like the obstruction. Okay, just looking like the bile is not going to come into the gallbladder from there it's not going to go into the duodenum so bile pathway is getting damaged if the bile pathway as it's getting damaged what happens so this patient is going to have elevated levels of alkaline phosphorus see pathway is defective the pathway is damaged so even in this biliary, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis autoimmune condition even in this condition the alkaline phosphatase levels are elevated see any condition which causes the damage or which causes the block to the biliary pathway in those condition alkaline phosphatases are elevated here also the liver is normal that there is no problem with the liver set that pathways are getting damaged so direct bilirubin direct bilirubin Levels are elevated, the direct bilirubin levels are elevated, so alkaline phosphorases are elevated and direct bilirubin levels are elevated. Okay, so what is something important about this primary biliary cirrhosis? See, it's an autoimmune condition, so all the autoimmune conditions are going to be most commonly seen in females, sir. Okay, it's going to be most commonly seen in females. In which females? Usually, these females are going to be 20 to 50 years old. Okay, in between 20 to 50 years, so young only. Usually, it's seen in young age only, 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 years most of the times. So, this primary biliary cirrhosis is seen in females, and most of the time, in the question they will mention, they usually have some other autoimmune disease association like diabetes, mellitus, or rheumatoid arthritis, okay, or thyroiditis. Okay, so they usually mention some other autoimmune association because most of the time, autoimmune diseases. Like, you know, come together. Okay, come together. So, they usually have these associations, sir. Like, other autoimmune associations will be seen. So, sir, please tell us one thing. Just by looking at one word, we want to put the diagnosis that this is primary biliary cirrhosis. The most important keyword is, these patients will have antibodies, sir. Do you know which antibodies? Then, primary biliary cirrhosis, the patients are going to have anti-mitochondrial. Okay, anti mitochondrial antibodies. So, anti mitochondrial antibodies are going to be positive. Whenever you see this one word, sir, anti mitochondrial antibodies, uh, anti mitochondrial antibodies are positive, then 100% they are talking about this primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay, primary biliary cirrhosis. And these patients with primary biliary cirrhosis, they usually Okay, one association where they usually have is they are going to have high levels of cholesterol in their body. Okay, they usually have high levels of cholesterol in their body, sir. So, this cholesterol is going to cause again gallstones. Okay, because of these gallstones, again there can be obstructive jaundice. Again, there can be obstructive jaundice. So, primary biliary cirrhosis, autoimmune condition, mostly seen in females. Intrahepatic bile ducts are getting damaged. These patients are highly associated with cholesterol. That cholesterol is the one which causes the gallstones. So whenever there are gallstones, yes, there is a elevated levels of there are elevated levels of alkaline phosphatase as well as direct bilirubin because obstruction, obstructive jaundice. Okay, so these patients are going to have anti-mitochondrial antibodies as it's an autoimmune condition. Most of the time, it comes in association with other autoimmune disorders. Are the parents or the siblings? They usually have some other autoimmune disorders like. SLE, vitiligo, Zogren syndrome, other autoimmune disorders, sir. Okay, so these are some important points which I want you to know regarding primary biliary cirrhosis. Primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay, so after primary biliary cirrhosis, the next important point which I want you to know is primary sclerosing cholangitis. Cholangitis, sir. Okay, the patient is now having cholangitis. That's right. What is this cholangitis? Okay. Cholangitis. 
So what is this cholangitis? If you ask me, in the name itself, it's there. Angitis, cholangitis, inflammation. Inflammation of what? Inflammation of the bile ducts. Okay, the bile ducts. The bile ducts are inflamed. Both intrahepatic, extrahepatic bile ducts are going to be inflamed. So inflammation of bile ducts. So why these bile ducts are getting inflamed? See, the bile ducts are getting inflamed because the bile ducts are getting inflamed. Okay, the bile ducts are getting inflamed because the infection, there is this infection, ascending infection from the duodenum, infection is coming into the biliary tract. There is ascending of the infection, there is ascending infection coming from the intestines into the bile or into the biliary tree. So now because of this infection, there is inflammation. Okay, are you getting? So inflammation of the bile ducts, what is the reason? Ascending infection. Infection, ascending infection. For example, let me show you. Look, see, from here, from the duodenum. Now, the bacteria are ascending up like this and causing inflammation and causing inflammation of this entire biliary tree that is called as cholangitis. Okay. So, what is the most common organism? So, the most common organisms are going to be Escherichia coli, E. coli. Okay. So, ascending infection, E. coli. The organism. And second thing which I want you to know is the cholangitis is usually associated with one inflammatory bowel disorder. It's associated with, with inflammatory bowel disease. Do you know what is that inflammatory bowel disease? Most of the time in your exams, if they want to ask a question, they will say the person who is having, okay, the person who is having ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis, sir. See, usually ulcerative colitis patients, the colon is going to be most commonly affected. So, the patients are going to have bloody diarrhea, the bloody diarrhea. Now, in these patients, they will also talk about the patient is having right upper quadrant pain or abdominal pain. Not just right upper quadrant pain, they can simply say abdominal pain, sir, because both intrahepatic, extrahepatic, bile ducts are getting inflamed because of the inflammation. Okay, they are getting inflamed, because, uh, like, you know, they are getting inflamed. Cholangitis, sir. So, associated with inflammatory bowel diseases, most of the time in your exam, it will come together with ulcerative colitis and they can also be seen along with Crohn's disease. So, Crohn's disease. So, what exactly is Crohn's disease? Crohn's disease is also an inflammatory bowel disorder. So, both this Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis can lead to cholangitis. They can lead to cholangitis. Okay. So, this is the point which I want you to no, sir. What else can lead to cholangitis? What else? See, now we have performed some diagnostic study. We have performed the diagnostic study. What is the diagnostic study that we have performed? For example, we have performed endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography. We have performed endoscopic. See, we are send, sending the probe like this and we have performed endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography. So, during the study process, during the study process, we might damage, okay, we might damage these ducts, okay, we might damage these ducts, so that can lead to inflammation within these ducts. So, one of the cause for this cholangitis is ERCP, okay, so ERCP, that is endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography can lead to uh, cholangitis. So, what are the three important causes of the cholangitis? Ascending infections with the E. coli, associated with the inflammatory bowel diseases, especially ulcerative colitis. If a patient is ulcer having ulcerative colitis, the patient is going to have which positivity? P. anca positivity. Okay, P. anca positivity is going to be seen. That also they will mention in the exam. Okay, the patient is having P. anca positivity. Okay, and pain in the abdomen. So, pain in the abdomen, bloody diarrhea, P. anca positivity. You should think that this patient is having cholangitis, cholangitis, sir. Okay, so usually the patients who are having cholangitis are going to have a triad of symptoms. They will have a triad of symptoms. Of course, these are non-specific symptoms, but this is called as a charcoal triad. Okay, charcoal triad, sir. So what exactly is this charcoal triad? So the patient is going to have fever. Okay, what the patient is having? Fever. Next, jaundice and abdominal pain. The patient is having fever. Jaundice and abdominal pain. 
okay, fever, jaundice and abdominal pain, sir. So, why fever? Inflammation is there, okay, inflammation of the ducts, abdominal pain, not just right upper quadrant abdominal pain, usually they will say the abdominal pain, okay. Actually, it should be, yes, of course, it should be right upper quadrant abdominal pain because the biliary tree is a common bile duct, is getting inflamed, okay. So, next, jaundice. Jaundice can be seen, sir, because the inflammation, that inflammation can cause obstruction that can lead to obstructive jaundice also, okay. So, these are some important points which I want you to know for the cholangitis. What is the triad that is seen in the cholangitis? That is called as a charcoal triad, where the patient is going to have fever, jaundice and abdominal pain. What are the three causes of cholangitis? The three causes of the cholangitis are ascending infection with the E. coli or some other bacterioids. Second thing is associated inflammatory bone conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's can lead to cholangitis and the third condition is endoscopic retrograde pa uh, cholangiopancreaticography can also cause damage to the bile ducts causing the inflammation of the bile ducts sir. okay so these are some important points which i want you to know for your exam so with this the four topics we have completed that is gallstones we have discussed about the different types of gallstones cholesterol gallstones pigmented gallstones we have seen okay the gallstones topic is completed after that cholecystitis cholecystitis Acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis. Acute cholecystitis means usually the symptoms are going to be like cholelithiasis upon which the patient is going to have fever. Okay. Next, chronic cholecystitis. Chronic cholecystitis means the calcification of the gallbladder, the porcelain gallbladder causing a risk, uh, increasing the risk for the cancer. Okay. That's also completed. Next, we have discussed about the primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Cholangitis, sir. Okay, cholangitis and primary biliary cirrhosis. Whenever you whenever you see the word anti mitochondrial antibodies, it's primary biliary cirrhosis. It's a destruction of the intrahepatic bile ducts. Okay, autoimmune condition seen in females. Okay, usually of 20 to 50 years. That is primary biliary cirrhosis and cholangitis. So with this, today's topic is completed. See you in the tomorrow's class. Thank you.